I have a word of encouragement for you, and I trust that it's going to come out because I don't have, I don't really have notes. I don't have an outline because God changed everything up on me at the last minute. But I know what God wants to do this morning. He wants to encourage us. The title that I asked the media team to put up is Lord, If You Only. And I feel like God wants to follow up Patricia's message from last week, which was amazing, powerful, profound. If you did not hear her message, if my people, please go to our Shiloh YouTube channel and watch this message. It is an absolute now critical key word that will encourage you and empower you to be part of what God is doing right here, right now. I want to share, and I'm going to share a little bit about how this happened, but the reason I, I asked the media team to entitle this morning's message, Lord, If You Only, is I feel like sometimes when we have great faith for something, we don't realize it, but we start to put dictates on God about how, what it has to look like and how it has to look. And we start to say, well, Lord, if you only did this, or if you'd only done this, or I expected this. And this morning in my prayer time, the Lord started showing me the pattern of many of the messages we've had together for the last year and a half. And how he's been encouraging us, how even going back to early 2019, when we were saying 2019 was the year of relaying some scriptural foundations, and specifically one of the ones we emphasized here was Genesis 1, 26 through 28. How God was reminding us that we are his people meant to rule and reign in the earth as dominion stewards, that we, that we had a role to play, and that 2020 would be the year to represent. That was, that was one of the prophetic words in our house. There were many prophetic words over 2020. There were wonderful prophetic words from many prophets about it being a year of clarity of vision. And my goodness, we talked about that a couple weeks ago in the message, Can You See It? Because it has been a year of clear vision. We've clearly been able to see what the enemy is doing. Last Tuesday, it became even more clear what the enemy is doing. And again, I'm not talking about politics or, or, or parties or politicians. I'm talking about the powers and principalities behind it all. It became so clear that there is corruption and treachery in our nation. It has become so, you have to not want to see it at this point. The level of deception and corruption in this election. But what I ask you to, to hearken back to what we've talked about, can you see the divine setup in it? Yes. What if, what if we switch from, Lord, if you would only put in the candidate we were believing for, to, Lord, Thank you that you're, you're truly the God of Isaiah 55, 8. Your ways truly are higher than my ways. Your ways truly are beyond my understanding. And I've told the Lord a few times in the last week, I don't understand. But the Lord reminds me, you're not called to be an understander. You're called to be a believer. How many times in this house have I stood with you and said to myself and to you, the only reason God doesn't meet our expectations is because he wants to exceed them. What if God truly wants to do what we've been asking to bring revival, to bring reformation, to truly destroy and tear down the powers and principalities in our land? What if God is saying, I not only want to bring a leader into place who will partner with me to bring an end to Roe versus Wade and child sacrifice in the land, I want to tear down every power and principality that 63 million child sacrifices have given place to rule and reign in this land. What if he wants to tear it all down? What if he wants to do something beyond putting a man or woman in the White House and he wants to truly bring reformation to our country? What if he really wants to answer our prayers? Are we going to be the ones who say, well, Lord, if you'd only done this, I'd still believe. Or Lord, if you'd only done this, then I'd be okay. Let me tell you, it doesn't bear good fruit. I know. I've, been, I, I've done it at times. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I don't need to understand. My wife came into our, our bedroom the other night, and she was like, honey, what is going on with you? And I said, I'm having a moment. <laughs> it's not a good moment. It's not a God moment. It's not a productive moment. I'm not going to stay in this moment. I'm so sorry you had to hear and see this moment. Lord, I'm sorry you had to. But God, <sighs> we talked a couple weeks ago and I've been prophesying this whole year that the church is being presented with an Exodus 14 opportunity. 
And we talked about how in Exodus 14, it wasn't just Pharaoh came, uh, Pharaoh decided, you know what? I'm gonna go get those guys. Exodus 14, it clearly indicates God hardened Pharaoh's heart so he would pursue the people. Why? So the enemy in all of his power, he takes every horse, every chariot, every soldier, every sword, every shield, every weapon to pursue God's people. And most of the people freak out and actually say, oh, we were better off in bondage. Well, at least we had leeks and onions back in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here and to die? Most of the church played the role of Joe Pantaleona in, I probably said his Italian name wrong, but in the Matrix. They just said, I want to go back in the Matrix. The steak tasted good in the Matrix. But God has been trying to wake us up. He has awoken us. Don't worry if some of the church isn't awake yet. And I encourage you, because I wrestled this week with people I know who were good Christians who voted for a party and a ticket that is anti-Israel and anti-life, anti-church and anti-God, and I didn't understand. And it grieved me deeply. But then I realized, wait, this isn't bearing any good fruit. What if I choose to see that they, have, they thought they were doing good? They hoped they were doing good, and they had a heart for certain things that, that this party says they're for, even though none of their policies indicate they actually are. But what if, like all of us, for a moment they were deceived, but we believe in their good hearts, and we pray for those good hearts, because we need those good hearts. I need my liberal brothers and sisters. I want my brothers and sisters in Christ who are connected to the liberal heart of God, not the, not the wrong heart of God, but God does have a heart. I love that God cares about the disenfranchised and he fights for the widows and the orphans and the marginalized, and we have to as well. We just can't ever fight for them so much that we start to say wickedness is good. But don't waste time pointing fingers right now. Don't waste, remember the word that uh, two weeks ago, one of the eight mistakes we can't afford to make. I had a word go out through the Elijah list on Monday and I forgot it Tuesday. <laughs> the devil wants you disappointed. <laughs> Actually, it was Wednesday. I did pretty well. I mean, I, I was wrestling in the spirit with the things, that, that the treachery and stuff we could feel in the spirit that was going on Tuesday night. But it wasn't probably until Wednesday night when I started to wrestle with disappointment. And I went, oh, Lord, wait, you gave me that word about how the devil wants us disappointed. Because when we're disappointed, we quite literally disappoint ourselves. We take on a victim mentality. We take on fear. We take on doubt. And now we don't rule and reign in the earth. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to remind you that God is still on the throne. God is still in charge. God has a plan. And God may be doing something bigger than we can see or understand right now. What if we had to be in this exact position so we could see all of Pharaoh's army? Because in Exodus 14, the, the people see all of Pharaoh's army. Most of them make the mistake of getting afraid, discouraged, embittered, wanting to go back into bondage, wanting to not have to fight. But Moses says, fear not, the Lord will fight for you. You won't even have to lift a finger. And then God corrects Moses and says, most of that's right, son, but I do want you to stretch forth your hand because you do have a role to play. I will win the fight. I am up to something. I have arranged all of this, but I need you to participate. And you can say, God doesn't need anything from us. I agree, but I'm just telling you what scripture says. Since Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, since day six of creation, God has said we're part of his plan. That's why the enemy's working so hard to discourage. That's why the enemy's working so hard to get us disappointed. That's why the enemy's working so hard to get us to turn against one another and point fingers. Because God is up to something and we are gonna see the victory. I don't know how, I don't know when, and I don't really like that. <laughs> I find that challenging. But then I say, wait a minute. Most of your people thought the cross was a defeat too. What if Tuesday, what if Wednesday, what if the media's announcement yesterday, which by the way, this thing's not done yet, even in the natural, but the media, and I'm going to say something strong, and this is thus thinketh Robert, I believe when we read Isaiah 44, 
um, uh, verses 23, 24, 25, I think it is. We did a prayer meeting, online prayer meeting Tuesday morning. Several of us rallied in prayer. Desiree, myself, uh, 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 Stacy Campbell, Patricia King, and Derek Ott. And Derek got the word out of Isaiah 44 and was praying how God was going to um, uh, render the false prophets, show them to be false. Now, hear me. I am not talking about the prophets of God that declared Donald Trump will get a second term in office. That's not determined yet in the natural. We don't know if that's gonna come true or not yet. I am talking about the false prophets, not prophets who missed it. And I'm not saying those prophets missed it. I actually believe it can still happen. I believe this is far from done if we inhabit our place. And I wanna honor people like Susan Cheatham who's not only leading us in worship and praise to enthrone Jesus in this nation, because he's enthroned on the praises of his people, so we're actually bringing him into this through our praise and worship, but she's working in the natural to organize peaceful demonstrations and prayer marches and all sorts of great stuff. My wife has a friend, Amanda Hasty, who has been for five years now organizing prayer for President Trump throughout this state. We have so many champions out there. This thing is not done in the natural, but what we need to focus on this morning is how do we participate with it in the spirit? And this morning when I was in my prayer time, I, had a, I, had a, I got to, to talk yesterday with one of, the, one of the true generals of the body of Christ yesterday. And we had a good conversation. We were checking in with each other. And um, the, the, this, this general said to me that right now they're in a process where they feel like they're grieving. They feel like there's been a death of something. And I get that. I get that emotional process. And I am thrilled that this leader was willing to be honest with me. So this morning, uh, and they weren't giving up. They were just being honest. It's, it's where they are right now. You know, it, it's okay to be where you are, but if you realize it's not going to produce good fruit, just don't stay there. God loves to meet us exactly where we are. Don't ever pretend to be not where you are. Just let God not keep you there if it's not a, or help you not stay there if it's not a good place. So I was praying for this leader this morning, and I was praying into this sense of grieving and death, and this is when God told me to not share, or I felt from the Lord. I always want to be careful as a prophetic people not to make it sound like a booming voice came. But I knew, my newer knew, I was not to share the word I had planned, but he wanted me to share out of John 11 this morning, out of the story of Lazarus. So what I want to do is I want to read through this story with you this morning and bring you some scriptural, some heavenly, and some prophetic um, insight into what's going on right now. Because this is what hit my heart when I was praying for this leader this morning and anyone in the body who was dealing with understandable grief and a sense of, of that. Um, I felt the Lord ask me a question. He said, are you willing to believe this will not end in death? Because in the story of Lazarus, Jesus says to the disciples, this will not end in death. Now, what was so challenging to so many is Lazarus died. But Jesus never said Lazarus would not die. He said it wouldn't end in death, and it didn't. Jesus, as we'll see in this story, had a purpose for this because he wanted to reveal something greater of who he was and a greater glory of God than anyone knew of him yet, even in those who loved him and served him. A man named Lazarus was sick. A nation named the United States of America has had some sickness in it, some darkness. He lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, the one you love is very sick. America has some, some, some sickness in it, some darkness, some things in it that need to be dealt with. This morning, it was actually last night when I was talking to my wife, but then this morning when I was taking communion, the Lord gave me the revelation last night. This morning, I activated it. The Lord showed me that one of the things I needed to do this morning as I was doing my, my hour of prayer for the USA was as I was looking at, okay, we see very clear evidence of some sickness of corruption in our nation, some sickness of vote, voter fraud and election tampering. But the Lord reminded me that through many different times, many different organizations, and in many different nations, we as a nation have tampered with elections and fixed elections in other countries at other times. And so the Lord said, look, deal with that in the spirit. Remove the landing strip for the enemy to corrupt. And so I, I, I 
I did Second Chronicles 7, 14 for me and my family and my bloodlines and heritage. And then once all of that was done, I said, Lord, now as a citizen of this nation, as a leader in one of the spheres of this nation, I identificationally repent for my nation, for where we have gone into countries to manipulate to, 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 to um, create voter fraud, to tamper with elections. I repent of that on behalf of the nation. And he led me through all these prayers. And then once that was done and I took communion and, and received healing into the soul of the nation, then all of a sudden I was able to bind the powers and principalities of corruption, of malfeasance, of deception, of all of that. And then I commanded them to go because they have to, because once we remove the landing place, once the strong man is bound, we can kick him and all his minions out. So I'm expecting a change, but we, I had to take authority over the sickness. Part of what God is helping us to see is not only all of the enemy on display, and again, we're not talking about parties or politicians, we're talking about powers and principalities that we need to deal with. And there's sickness in this land. There's been 63 million child sacrifices since Roe vs. Wade. That kind of blood, the, 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 the bloodshed of the innocent is one of the four things scripture tells us defiles the land. That doesn't mean we hang our head in shame, especially if we've been part of that. It means we've, we, we receive forgiveness. We know we're still loved and we know we're part of the solution. And if anyone like me, I told you guys, when I was a young man in my 20s, I drove two women to get an abortion. I thought I was doing good. I thought I was helping them. I was not the father of those um, uh, babies, but I still participated. I don't hang my head in shame over that. I wish I hadn't done it, but I know God loves me. I know I'm forgiven. I know he's big enough to deal with all of that, but I also knew I had to look him in the eye and say, Father, I realize now what I did. Forgive me. And I received that forgiveness. And now I believe I have great authority in this realm to see people saved, healed, and delivered who are considering that option. But even more to deal with the root issue because I have chosen not to be a part of that anymore, but to be a part of the solution. So there's no guilt or shame or condemnation. That's the enemy lying to you that if you participated in that, you need to be ashamed. No, you need to realize you're loved and forgiven. And you need to realize that God's plan for you is actually to be part of the solution because you're gonna carry a revelation of his love and his forgiveness and his kindness for you and for that beautiful, gorgeous baby that's alive and flourishing in heaven right now. You're gonna be able to share that testimony and you're gonna be able to take authority over that power and principality that's been seeded through that blood sacrifice. Do not hang your head in shame. Arise and see the goodness of glory of God in your life, but also allow it to move through your life. So America has some places it's been sick and the sisters have been crying out. Women often represent the church. And I, when I read two sisters this morning, I thought, oh, we're looking at a great revival. I was thinking of the Hebrides revival that was birthed by two older sisters, two older, slightly enfeebled sisters. And all they had was prayer. That's it. So they had the greatest weapon God has given us. We can never dismiss and diminish prayer, especially we can't fall in the place of, Lord, if you would only, then I'd believe that my prayers would work. No, your prayers are working. We've already seen great victories. We've seen even in the natural, even in the elections, we saw some great victories. We're going to see more great victories. Now, here's what's interesting. Lazarus and his sisters lived in a town named Bethany. Now, uh, in, in, in one of my Bible dictionaries, um, uh, Bethany has two definitions. I found this very interesting. It's often translated as the house of dates. We know Beth is house. But what was interesting to me is, in, is it Hitchcock, which uh, there's four little Bible dictionaries in this one app of mine. But Hitchcock is specifically the name dictionary. And when I looked Bethany up in there, I was surprised that it has two meanings, the house of song and the house of affliction. So which is it going to be? Are we going to say, oh, we're afflicted. Lord, if you would only, then I could sing. No, we sing because he is Lord. We sing because he is moving. We will be the house of song. So the two sisters cry out and they say, send a message to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is very sick. The United States of America might have sickness, but I am here to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ loves the United States of America. 
Not everything we've done, not everything we're doing, but he loves this nation and he's not done with this nation. And he created this nation for a plan and a purpose. One of those is to be a friend and ally to Israel. And that was one of the reasons we were contending for one party platform over the other because they have put on display, they want to be a blessing to Israel. So it's not about a man. It's about a platform, it's about a position, it's about righteousness, it's about what is on God's heart and how do we participate in it. No man, no woman will be fully righteous. If you happen to vote for Mr. Biden and Mrs. Harris and they do get into office, don't you dare put your hope in them. And I'm not saying it's because they're wicked, I'm saying our hope can never be in a man or woman. It's always in God. What we can do though is say, what does this man or woman say they wanna work towards? What have they shown they wanna work toward? Because I had someone challenge this week about when did the prayers of the church come about, be, uh, become focused on getting a man reelected? I said, my prayers are not about a man getting reelected. My prayers are about a revival and a reformation coming to this nation. And I see God's plans and purposes through one party more than another. But absolutely the man is flawed. And if he doesn't get into office, my hope is not, was not in him. My hope is that God can move in anything and anyone. Excuse me. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, now remember, Martha and Mary and Lazarus have met with Jesus, have eaten with Jesus, have conversed with Jesus. For all we know, they laid their head on his chest like John the Beloved at one of the many meals. They've been at his feet. When they said, they didn't just say, Lord, help. They said, Jesus, we know you're Lord. We know you're healer. But we also know your friend. We also know you love us. They said the one you love is sick unto death. They had this revelation of so much of who Jesus is. And yet this is what Jesus' response is. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God. So he's saying this won't end in death. So often we hear promises like that, and I do this, and we start to lean on our own understanding. I still believe the word of the prophets that said President Trump will get a second term. I actually still believe it, call me crazy. But even in the natural, this isn't done. And I am not, I am not putting people I know who have prophesied that on a pedestal and saying they can't miss it. Of course they can miss it, any prophet can miss it. We all know in part, yet, I still sense God's plans and purposes and see them in this, so I'm continuing to pray. And I believe God wants to destroy all of the enemy in his army. So he's allowing us to see a level of corruption, deception, and a network of evil powers and principalities that have trapped many men and women. I'm actually praying for many of the politicians and media people that we're seeing are truly given over to the deception of the enemy. God doesn't want them destroyed, he wants them saved, but he wants the network of darkness revealed and destroyed. And if he simply had gotten, and I'm gonna say something bold, his man back into office, not his savior, not our hope, but he puts kings on thrones, and I believe God's desire was to put a man back in control of this nation who is aligned much more with his plans and purposes. I could be wrong about that. It's okay. I believe it, and I'm not giving up on that. Now, if something else happens, what I'm really not giving up on is God's ability to turn it all to the good. But do we, we, we get these words like, President Trump will get a second term. And if we get so focused on it, we can think what that means is he'll be reelected re in a landslide on November 3rd. Now, some of what I'm hearing is he might have been reelected in a landslide on November 3rd. There's actually a fair amount of evidence of that. But if it hadn't gone this way, we wouldn't be aware of the level of corruption that we need to work with God to tear down. So this is actually maybe to the glory of God. We can't get so attached to this will not end in death to think, oh, that means he won't die. No, he didn't say Lazarus wouldn't die. He said this will not end in death. And it didn't. It's for the glory of God. 
And I believe what Jesus wanted for those he loved and who were willing to know him, love him, trust him, and serve him was to reveal a greater measure of who he was than even they had known at that point. Every single one of you knows God in so many ways and you've been praying so fervently and diligently. I am here to tell you not one prayer has been wasted. Not one prayer has fallen to the ground. Not one tear. Not one praise, not one worship song, not one blow of the shofar, not one thing you've done in the natural, not one vote. Even if that software system, you know, switched it over like they're showing it did. Or in Arizona, they gave you a Sharpie so they could throw that one out. It didn't get wasted. Something went forth in the spirit and it will be to the glory of God. If you had a Sharpie vote, start praising God that you're part of revealing the wickedness of the enemy because it's pretty obvious. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God. I, the Son of God, will receive glory from this. Do you believe that Jesus can receive glory from where we are right now? I do. I really do. Although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days and did not go to them. It specifically says, because he loved them, he tarried. What if God loves America so much that he's tarrying right now so that all this can come up, all this can be revealed? What if he's intentionally tarrying because he's going to be glorified in a greater way than we've imagined? Woo! Finally, after two days, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Okay, let's get this thing moving. But his disciples objected. Teacher, they said, only a few days ago, the Jewish leaders in Judea were trying to kill you. Are they going there? Are you, and you're going there again? So what does Jesus have to deal with in his plan? The faith of the church. The disciples are saying, but we don't understand, and we don't like it, and this looks dangerous, and we could be embarrassed, or we could be killed, or we could be arrested. I hear they're making websites with, uh, with names of people who voted for Donald Trump. I better not let anybody know. I better hide. Oh my gosh, Lord. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Lord, if only you had done it this way, then I'd believe. Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. As long as it is light, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. Only at night is there danger of stumbling because there is no light. There's darkness right now, but it's God arranging it. We need to keep moving. In, in, in the natural, we can stumble in the darkness of the, of the world. But we're not walking in the natural. We're walking in the spirit. And in the spirit, there's never any darkness. We are connected to heaven. We are of heaven where there's no sun, there's no moon. The only light is constant because it's God. You never lack light in this world. And we must look to him. We must arise. We must lift up our eyes. We must abandon all fear, all doubt, all hopelessness. If you stumbled last week, shake it off. Shake it off. Because we're not just running a race, we're running it to the end. And I'm here to tell you the race isn't over yet. And you have light in Christ. You have light in the spirit. You have light in the eternal realm. You have light in you. And we're gonna walk by that light. We're gonna walk by faith. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, that means he's getting better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus is having a good night's rest. But Jesus meant Lazarus had not died. Jesus was not a fool and he was not wrong. He was saying, I know to each and every one of you, Lazarus looks like he died. I am here to tell you this will not end in death. I am here to tell you he is sleeping. And I even want to lean into what the disciples said. If he's sleeping, that means he's getting better. What if what's going on right now is not the death of righteousness and justice in America? What if this is not the death of the hope of revival and reformation in America? What if nothing has died? What if it's just a sleep? And what if America's actually got an opportunity to get better through this? If we continue to believe, if we continue to walk by the light of truth more than the light of facts, if we continue to walk by the light of the word of the Lord as opposed to the false word of the lying prophets of media. 
Then he told them plainly. Don't you love when Jesus tells us plainly? Lazarus is dead. Wait a minute, Lord. I thought you said he wouldn't, it wouldn't end in death. It won't. I want you to look at the facts as they are because I want you to realize facts change. Truth does not. The facts are right now the media is declaring the next president of this nation. Those are facts. The media is declaring it. But as of now, the Constitution does not say the media declares who our next president is. And even if it did, God's still on the throne and our hope is in him. And the media does not get to declare God is dead. Time Magazine tried it in the 70s. It didn't work out real well. There was actually a cover. I think it was Time. It might have been Newsweek. I think it was Time said, God is dead. Talk about sitting in the heaven and laughing. He's thinking, I don't even have the sniffles. What are they talking about? <laughs> then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. Now, that sounds hard-hearted until you realize what he's saying is, I'm up to something huge here. I'm doing this for your sake, for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the United States of America. The key is to be the house of song, not the house of affliction. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there because this will give you another opportunity to believe in me. Now, here's the thing. That scripture, and I'm in the old new living. I'm in my 96 new living. And that scripture used to bug me because it's like, wait a minute, they already believe in you. They know you're the Lord. That's why they cried out to you. And then I realized what he was saying is I'm gonna give you an opportunity to believe in me in ways you haven't yet. You know I'm Lord. You know I'm friend. You know I'm your beloved. You know I'm healer. You're going to know me as the resurrection. You're going to know me as revival and reformation for an entire nation. I am giving you an opportunity to believe in me in an even greater way because you have a role to play here. Are you willing to be the house of song or the house of affliction? Are you willing to be one who trusts in the Lord no matter what? Are you going to be one who says, Lord, if you'd only done it this way then... Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, oh, sorry, I missed a part. Um, so Jesus says, because of the, this will give you another opportunity to believe in me. Come, let's go see him. Come, let's move. Will you walk with me? Will you move with me? Will you be part of what I'm about to do? Thomas, the twin, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. I love that this is Thomas, nicknamed the twin, you know whose twin you are? Your father's. You were made in his image. This is an opportunity for us to be Jesus' brother, Jesus' bride. This is our opportunity to look and sound like our father, to be a part of what he wants to do in the earth. So let's move with him and die. Die to fear, die to doubt, die to hopelessness, die to bitterness, die to anxiety. I've been dying all week. And I've been getting resurrected all week. And every time I shake it off, I realize, oh, I get to arise and shine. And now I get to look just like my Jesus and pray just like my Jesus and love my nation just like my Jesus and be a house of song in the midst of what I thought was affliction just like my Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. So he was going to Jerusalem, but he stopped at Bethany to do something amazing, and it was only a few miles away from the destination. Do you realize how close we are to revival and reformation? It's only a few miles down the road. Will we walk with Jesus? Will we trust in Jesus? Will we pray with Jesus, worship with Jesus, declare Jesus, pray with Jesus? It's only a few miles away. And many of the people would come to pay their respects and console Martha and Mary on their loss. There's going to be many that are ready to grieve. Don't be one of them. There are going to be many who even in good intention are kind of come to you and say, give up, lighten up. Just grieve. It's okay. It's going to all be okay. Jesus is still on the throne. I know Jesus is on the throne. That's not the issue. The issue is will I participate in what my king who rules and reign wants to do? That's the issue. None of this is about... What are, you, what are you getting worked up about? Jesus is still on the throne. I know. That's why I'm getting worked up. 
I want to be a part of his solution. Now, I don't want to get worked up in the flesh, but I sure want to get stirred up in the spirit. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, Lord, if you would only, if you'd only done it according to my understanding, my timeline, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. I believe what Jesus is doing here is to say, I know that you know he'll give me whatever I ask. But what I'm trying to move you into is to realize he'll give you whatever you ask. Because I'm preparing you to be the dominion steward in the earth. I'm preparing you to step back into the fullness of relationship in the plan since day six. I'm thrilled you know who I am. I need you to wake up and know who you are. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, when everyone else rises on resurrection day. She's still saying, look, I don't think you understand how clearly I get what's going on here, Lord. I understand it. I sure wish you did. Well, I'm trying to tell you, your brother's going to rise in about 10 minutes. Oh, I know he'll rise one day on resurrection day. No, I'm trying to tell you I am the resurrection. No, I get it. One day you'll be the resurrection. No, you don't get it. But I love you so much, I'm going to keep working with you. Yes, Martha said, when everyone else rises on resurrection, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha, are you willing to move past, Lord, if you had only to dictate how I need to move, or are you willing to simply walk with me, trust me, know who I am, trust that I actually am in the God of Isaiah 55, 8, and that's a good thing that you don't understand what's going on because I'm about to do something you've been crying out for. We say, Lord, do exceedingly abundantly beyond our ability to ask, think, or comprehend. And he says, cool, great, I've been waiting to. And then when he starts, we go, oh, Lord, if you would only. I don't understand. Well, you just asked me to do something beyond your understanding. <laughs> oh, this is like David in Psalm 13. You're in the bipolar Psalm. Okay, just keep up with me. You'll get there because I love you and I'll walk with you every step of the way. And I'll never give up on you, even if for a moment you give up on me. Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And he's thinking, I know. That's why I'm working with you. That's why I'm wanting to reveal even more of me to you. I'm so proud of what you know of me. I'm so proud you know I'm Messiah. I'm Lord. I'm healer. I'm friend. I'm beloved. That's why I know I can work with you and you can be part of the solution, even for the ones who do not yet know I am the Lord. Oh, Martha. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she left him and returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners. So God's working through her, and she doesn't even realize it yet. She's calling Mary aside from the mourners. She still doesn't understand, but she's being a help to her sister. Mary, who is, has sat at Jesus' feet, Mary, who had focused on the one good, true thing, she's actually so racked by not understanding the situation, she didn't even come to God. Martha usually gets the short end of the, 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 the appreciation stick from the church, and we think, oh, yeah, Martha's the one who was always working, and she didn't do the thing that Mar Mary did. Martha actually, she might have been ticked, but at least she went to the Lord with it. If you're ticked right now, go to the Lord with it. He's big. He can handle it. Mary wouldn't even go. But Martha came back and was already being used by God, and she didn't even know it. She calls Mary away from the mourners, away from the place of, oh, it's over, it's dead. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Now, see, she's still referring to him by what she's known him by. The teacher's here. But Jesus wants to reveal to her even more of who he is, and that's okay. He's working on it. Jesus wants to reveal to the church even more of who he is. Jesus wants to reveal to this nation even more of who he is. Now, Jesus has stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house trying to console Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was leaving to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. There's going to be a lot right now who will be really willing to go down the road of misery 
and sadness and defeat with you right now. Don't go with them. And if they try to surround you, just say, no, thank you. You don't have to win the argument, just win the battle. And the battle's not with flesh and blood, it's with powers and principalities. So pray and praise and worship. So they followed her. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if you would only. Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you'd only done it the way that I understood. Lord, if you'd only done what I was expecting. Lord, if only. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people waiting with her, he was moved with indignation and was deeply troubled. That's in my old New Living. I don't like that very much. I like the, um, uh, I looked up the NASB, and it was when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people waiting with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. I like that. Because I think he groaned for her. I think he groaned with her. I think he was troubled on her behalf. He wasn't groaning and indignant with her. It was on her behalf. I believe God is groaning right now with the church and for the church. God is groaning on behalf of America right now and on behalf of his plans and purposes. Holy Spirit is doing a Romans 8 groaning in intercession. Will we participate? They told him, Lord, come and see. Then, oh, uh, where have you put him, he asked them. What's the issue? What's the problem? Where is it? I'm really good at addressing these things. It's not over till it's over. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people, I'm sorry, I just read that. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Now, I believe this with all my heart. I've had people tell me that Jesus wept because Lazarus was dead. I'm gonna be honest, I'm no great theologian, but that just doesn't make any sense. Jesus has already said this isn't gonna end in death. I believe he was weeping on behalf of what everyone was going through because he knows it's a difficult process to come to know him in a greater way than we have before. I believe right now Jesus is weeping for the church, not because of the church. He knows this is challenging. He knows when he's doing something beyond our understanding, it, it's difficult for us. So he's weeping the tears of intercession to see us through this. He's weeping the tears that will oil our steps, that will butter our feet, that will bring us back into his presence. He's not mad at us. He's not judging us. He's not giving up on us. He's weeping on our behalf. And I believe there's some tears of pride. I think he's so proud of the remnant that rallied. I think he's so proud of the church that woke up and for months now has been humbling ourselves and praying and seeking his face and turning from our wicked ways and interceding on behalf of the nation. I believe he there are tears of pride mixed into those tears that he knows this is challenging, especially right here, right now, is challenging. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? Lord, if you only. I believe if you'd done what I expected, you healed a blind man. Why can't, why, why, why can't you keep Lazarus from dying? Because he had a bigger plan than that. This will not end in death. And I am telling you, this will not end in death. I don't know what it will look like. I'm not pretending to know what it will look like. But let's say our prayers weren't enough, and I find that very hard to believe. Very hard to believe. God is not in a numbers game. He's in a heart game. And the remnant's heart woke up and prayed and interceded on behalf of this nation, and we're not going to stop. But I had someone ask me many months ago when things looked darkest, do you really think prayer can shift it? And I said, yes. And they said, do you think there comes a point when a nation is so wicked, God takes his hand off that nation? And I said, yes, I do think that comes to a point. I don't think we're there yet in the USA yet. I believe that nation's hanging in the balance right now. But for that very much means to me, he's not done it yet. I said, but what about this? What if we get to that point, which I don't believe we will because the, the remnant has awoken. But what if we got to that point? I don't believe God ever takes his hand off his remnant. So why wouldn't we want to be a part of it? Why wouldn't we want to continue to believe and contend for this nation in his heart? Why would we go into the place of death? We can walk with him who is life. He will never take his hand off of it as his remnant. As we continue to stand for righteousness in the character and nature of him who is righteous. As we continue to declare truth and stand for truth in the character and nature of him who is truth. Don't get hard. Don't get embittered. Don't become the stone that blocks the glory of God moving. He has to roll the stone away, and I'm going to wrap up with that. 
But Martha, the dead man's sister, said, Lord, the smell will be terrible because he's been dead for four days. Now, what little I understand of Hebrew culture of the day, being dead for four days is, is dead, 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 dead. It doesn't get any more dead. Four days or four million years, you're as dead as dead can be. I don't fully understand that. I haven't studied it out, but somebody told me that once. So basically what he's being told is, it's too far gone. And he says, oh no, actually it's not. That's why I tarried. Because it's never too far gone. And I want you to see that. Jesus responded, too far gone. Now I've added that. But Jesus responded, didn't I tell you? You will see God's glory if you believe. Let's not be a people that says, Lord, if you only. Let's be a people who are those who, Lord, if we believe, we will see the glory of God. Let's be a people who choose to believe in the midst of the if, as opposed to choose to dictate what God should do in the midst of the if. Let's be a people who see the glory of God. There is the potential to see such a glory in this nation. Might it be challenging and ugly at times? Maybe, but what's that gonna do? Reveal more things that God wants to heal. Watch over your heart in this season. Don't let a stone be in front of it. Even if there are riots, even if there are, are, are protests, even if there are things that are heartbreaking, let your heart break. Don't let it get hard. Pray for everybody in this. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here. See, everything he's doing right now is for our sake. It's actually to rally faith. It's actually to rally our ability to see parts of him we've never seen before. Can a nation be saved in a day? Yes, it can. Are we willing to believe that? Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out, bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Now, I want to remind you where we started with this and we talked about the one you love is sick. I believe this is a parable of the United States right now. Not, not then, but prophetically, it's what I sensed this morning in my prayer time. And I am here to tell you our role as the body is to walk with Jesus, is to be willing to go with him, to realize we're only a little bit away from the destination, and if we need to die along the way, so be it. We'll die to fear, we'll die to doubt, we'll die to death. But let us be ones who participate with Jesus and shout, United States of America, come out. United States of America be healed. United States of America, this will not end in death. United States of America, come forth from the place of sickness, disease, death, and darkness. Come forth from the place where you have aligned and allowed dark powers and principalities. Come forth from wickedness and corruption and treachery and unrighteousness. Come forth from deception. Come forth from the traps and temptations, the lies and the lures of the enemy. Come forth, come forth, come forth. This is our chance to pray for our nation like God really wants to bring reformation. This will not end in death. This is not over. Jesus! And when the body of Christ, which was then Christ, Jesus yelled, Lazarus, come out. But he's not the body of Christ in the earth anymore. That's our job now. So now we stand before the place that looks like death and we say, United States of America, come out. Righteousness, come forth. Truth, justice, rule and reign. And if there's resistance or when we start to see it, there's still some cooties, then what we say is, Lazarus came out bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. So if we see any treachery or wickedness like we're seeing now, that's not America staying in the death place. That's our opportunity as we being the body of Christ to say treachery, deception, let him go. 
every manifestation of death and darkness. Get your hands off the United States of America. Get your hands off our executive, judicial, and legislative branches. Get your hands off these results. Be exposed, but every bit that's being exposed, we're gonna command it to be taken off our nation. That's why it's being exposed. Stand to your feet. Thank you, all of you who are at home. You're part of this solution, too. I know we have many of you from outside our country, and you've been praying along with us. I want to say a big thank you to Pastors Alvin and Mitch. We're getting ready to do the, Victoria, uh, the, school, uh, the, the school of the Victorious Soul in the nation of the Philippines online. And I know you've been praying for our nation. Thank you so much. But so many of you out there have been. Those of you who are involved in Firewall USA, thank you for every prayer. I know the battle's been long, but what I believe the Lord's gonna do right now, he's gonna strengthen and encourage you. He told me my prayer time this morning, I've been blowing the shofar all morning, and he said, every time I blow the shofar, it's not just a declaration of victory, but it's actually going to work to strengthen and encourage the body of Christ. So I'm gonna actually ask the worship team to come back up. I know that's a surprise. Even, even if it's just one person on the keyboard or whoever can come, come. If you can't come, that's okay. But I wanna go into a little bit of worship before we leave this morning. I'm gonna blow the shofar, but I'd love the band to be with me because when I blow the shofar in the natural, you never quite know what's gonna come out. But in the spirit, it's going to achieve this purpose. No matter how well or how poorly I blow the shofar, God ultimately is releasing his ruach to you. That's just a prophetic sign. And it doesn't matter if I do it well or I do it poorly because God does nothing poorly. I'm doing it as a prophetic sign because God promised me this morning he would rally the troops under the fulfillment of everything he has planned. We have an opportunity like Lazarus and Mary to come to know an aspect of our Jesus we've never seen before in the United States of America. We've never needed our God to come as a saver and reformer of our nation before. We do now. We get to see that he can do that now. And we're going to be those ones who believe. So as the worship team starts, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to blow the shofar. Um, whichever song you're feeling, you're very prophetic as a worship leader to take us back into. Um, don't you appreciate Susan and the team? Oh. Lord, we want to thank you that this is a historic moment in our nation and that you are rallying the troops. You're not rallying us against anything or anyone. You're rallying us for the kingdom of God. You're rallying us for righteousness. You're rallying us for truth. You're rallying us for true reformation and true revival. Lord, we declare that we're gonna walk this with you all the way out. We declare that we realize with you, we're only a little bit down the road from the victory. And Lord, we declare this will not end in death, but you are up to something beyond our ability to comprehend. And we rejoice in that. We praise you in that. And Lord, as we walk with you, I thank you that you are strengthening us to truly be the body of Christ in this hour, to truly stand before the place that the enemy has planned for the death of this nation and say no, to call this nation, to call every sphere of influence, to call our legislative, executive, and judicial branches from the place of death, to call the United States of America from the place of death, and to speak forth any single thing we see revealed, that we will stand before it and say, be thou removed from the United States of America. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord of hosts, come this morning and in this worship and in the blowing of the shofar, strengthen, encourage, and rally the troops that you are so proud of in Jesus' name. And if you want to be a part of that, simply say, amen. amen.